Oh, I might be heard, I might be heard, guys. And remember, it was a thumbs up. If you can hear me,
you can still be able to join us virtually. So you're getting, you're getting ready to begin. So just to explain that the official ceremony the official opening ceremony takes place at 1 p.m., but now we are doing a shout-out segment, and this is a segment that was introduced over the last two years when we had have to host the conference virtually. We implemented this segment, and we have decided to stick with this segment. So my name is... Marlon Joseph, I'm a member of the Garifuna Heritage Foundation here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I am so excited to be standing here in this room physically presenting this conference because, of course, for the past two years, we were completely restricted to the Zoom platform. But we are happy that we are finally back. But those of you who were faithful to us on the Zoom platform. We are happy that you are able to join us once more. So we're gonna have some music, we're gonna have some shout outs from different groups across the region and even internationally. We're gonna have some fun getting you warm, getting you alive for the official opening of the 10th International Garifuna Conference coming to you from Kingston, St. Vincent. So now we're gonna have some music, a musical interlude, our first musical interlude comes from Georgette Lambe with her popular song, Jeremy, enjoy. Thank you. 
I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. I I over the next three days, the International Caravana Conference is again an inspiration. We are back physically after not being able to do so for the last two years. But we are happy that we can present a conference physically. And we have decided to also retain the digital platform the Zoom platform that allowed so many of you to join us over the last three years when we were unable to physically present the conference. And of course, you many of you will have an opportunity to bring greetings on behalf of your respective organizations, on behalf of yourselves, and we will soon get right into the shout outs and I know the group are already logged in and they're called up and just to confirm that you're being heard that you're having audio. Right, so so we have now Chieftainess Ronaldo from the Jamaica Taino tribe. Chieftainess Ronaldo, welcome. Welcome, Mabrika Taino team, greeting relatives. It is such an honor to be here at the Garfunas 10th celebration. I bring greetings from my community. People. It was such a blessing and an honor to be able to, to, to sit here with you today and share with you some of the if some of the things that has been happening in, in our community in just a, in just this one one week. And I want to say that it is a charge that I'll be putting out for all of us to continue. Yesterday was International Women's Day. Um I want to touch a little bit on the strength of a woman and how much we can put forward. So one of our members um, 
put together uh, some amazing um, challenges that we've been having here in Jamaica. And we were invited to the IA, IACHR um, on Tuesday, and we were able to share the challenges, what we were having as indigenous people of our lands. And I I'm so proud and pleased and humbled to share that the Garifuna ambassador at large, Cynthia Ellis, came with us to LA and stand and stood in support with us at that moment. We we also had a, another person coming in from another great nations and we acknowledge the indigenous people there. And I just want to say that we are on the move. It is indigenous people's time. And again, sharing in the spirit of International Women's Day, it was a woman that was able to create that ground for us to step onto paramount um, chief of the Surinamese Maroons, Gamang Mamaji. And it enabled our communities, our combined communities of indigenous people of Jamaica to be able to put forward the, the, the charge. And again, the support of our, our um, relatives that came to support us on that day. So I say to you from Jamaica, Please continue the great work that you are doing. It is being noticed and we are able to lead that charge, especially in spaces of climate justice, food sovereignty and food security. Again, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to share with you and bring greetings from my humble country. Aham, thank you. Greetings and for that message. And we go right ahead, it's awesome to bring us a shout out. Now, she is a distinguished educator. She is the former president of the National Garifuna Council of Belize. She is a key member of the Yerme project, which seeks to reintroduce and reinforce Garifuna culture and heritage here in Yerme. In fact, she was in Claire Valley right here in Yerme, teaching the Garifuna language to our students. Isn't that wonderful? Now, I call on our dear sister, Dr. Gwen Williams. Yes. Yes. Greetings. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes. yes. Okay, so um, one minor correction, I was the president of the Belmopan branch. So we have a national president, and then we have president of different branches. But Kwiti Benafi, Marbrigal, from one of the Garifuna lands, Belize, Balisi, I greet you in the name of the great spirit, Bungyo God. Recording in progress. Guide. Bung your God who guides our paths, and I stand on the shoulders of the Garinabu, who withstood all atrocities, but remained vigilant in upholding our dignity and identity. Reaction to action, challenges and opportunities for promoting repertory justice for indigenous peoples in the Caribbean. And it is aligned with the Garifuna values of being action oriented. May this educational, meaningful, 
and timely discussion and analysis bring an action document that will move our cause forward. Happy Women's Month to all our Duguda powerful women and blessed interaction to all. Together we achieve Aubu Amurunu. I for you and you for me. Sereme, thanks. Ayo, goodbye. person to bring us greetings. He is a lecturer in the performing arts at the University of the West Indies. He has a group that's called Art in Action. And this is an organization that sought to use the performing arts as a medium for young people to reckon with social and other issues that are affecting them. I now call upon our brother, Brendan Lakai. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, greetings to Ms. Zoila Ellis Brown, founder of the Garifuna Heritage Foundation, Mr. David Darkey Williams, fellow theatre practitioner, and the president of the Garifuna Heritage Foundation, distinguished uh, participants, facilitators, presenters, and academics of the tent, the tent, International Garifuna Conference. Uh, greetings to the hardworking conference staff of the GHF. Uh, greetings from Trinidad and the Arts and Action Unit, which is based at the Department of Creative and Festival Arts at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine. Um, today, I, I, I bring not only the, my congratulations to the foundation on reaching uh, double figures in the implementation of this important conference, uh, I also bring our recognition of resilience and an equal commitment on the part of the GHF and all those who are of Garifuna and First Peoples heritage in the Caribbean region. Uh, as history has revealed to us, it was not intended for us to be here, to be here you know, uh, but as Zoila shared with me last night, we are still here. Uh, despite the ever-present grasp of a pandemic, uh, natural disasters and urgent concerns of climate change and their accompanying socio-economic, socio-political and socio-cultural challenges. Now I offer these sentiments not as an attempt to create some hollow effect or effect, sorry, but to recognize the years of commitment and hard work of the foundation and all of you who are dedicated to educating the world about the culture and the contributions of First Peoples and to envisioning, uh, which is important, envisioning our future societies or future societies which honor and respect not only Garifuna people, but all people around the world. Um, this is no simple feat. And so, because I believe we have so much to give to the world, and I believe this conference continues to be an important beacon of hope and of resonance. So as a simple gesture, I ask that all of you give yourselves a round of applause, eh? Because this conference and the work of the GHF deserve this recognition. Give yourselves a round of applause, man. Yeah? And so, I, I was told to be short, yeah, but I'm looking forward to the contributions and and the the offerings and the presentations of uh, at the at the foundation of the conference. Sorry, and in closing, I wish to thank the Garfield Heritage Foundation for allowing me to the, to, to to take this honor of, of bringing greetings from Trinidad, and I wish you all success. Thank you again. to remind you that the theme for the conference this year is from reaction to action, challenges and opportunities for promoting reparatory justice for indigenous peoples in the Caribbean. At this point, we'll take a musical interlude. Let us enjoy some Garifuna music from the artist Adrian 
Martinez. That is all of the official them of the of the ceremony and all that. So it's so what building building an atmosphere so that people can feel that yeah we are being warmed up for something special to come. So continuing with the shout out. So this well two people as a matter of fact now they represent a Garifuna, com Garifuna community in Los Angeles. We have Mr. Ronnie Pegora and Mrs. Cheryl Norales. Now they are responsible for keeping the Garifuna community together up there on the West Coast of the United States of America. And they have always offered, I must say, enthusiastic and vigorous support to the Garapuna Heritage Foundation here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So we are certainly very happy to have them joining us to bring us some remarks, although they're not able to be here with us physically. So let us hear now from Mr. Rani Figueroa and Mrs. Cheryl Morales. My name is Cheryl Norales, the founder of the United. I am honored to welcome you to the 10th graduation brought to you by the Garifuna Heritage Foundation of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Take on the mantle. Welcome, everyone. My name is Cheryl Norales, the founder of the Garifuna. Welcome you to the 10th International Garifuna Conference, brought to you by the Garifuna Heritage Foundation of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. As an indigenous and our history. We can't do this by participating in discussion and educational gatherings like this. So, we found that to fight for the institution owed to us for the form The most important thing is to be functional. First people of the Caribbean, I.O. Thank you, Cheryl. My name is Ronnie Figueroa. I am the vice president and co-founder of the Garifuna American Heritage Foundation United here in Los Angeles County, state of California. GAFU is a nonprofit 501c3 organization founded in 2005 with the purpose of the preservation of the language and culture. As part of the preservation efforts, we have published the Garifuna Language Workbook available on Amazon for $19.99. It is a wonderful learning tool for all those interested in learning the language. We also conduct drumming, dance, culture, and history workshops at colleges and universities throughout the country and the diaspora. For example, we travel uh, to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We were part of the contingent that uh, went there in 2019 
invited by the then Honorable Mr. Maki to conduct six different workshops in the Garifuna communities in St. Vincent, such as Fancy, Sandy Bay, Georgetown. We had with us well-known singer, composer, Mr. Aurelio Martinez, drummer and singer, Bodoma, Guanarawa chief, Mr. Flavio Alvarez, and Guanarawa dancer and master drummer, Carlos Domingo Alvarez, Gayusa, our singer, Miss Berta Loredo, master drummer, Glenn Garcia, my beautiful wife, Cheryl, was there as well, and the director of Gafu's Dance Ensemble, Mrs. Erica Zuniga. So we wish you the best on this grand, grandiose event, and which is the 10th International Conference. I.O. We mentioned earlier that this year the conference is being presented physically and virtually. So we've heard from some of our virtual participants. Now we're going to hear from someone who is here with us in Kingston. And this brother, and I think I can, in every sense of the word, refer to him as a brother in terms of people who are Garafuna community here in St. Vincent and Grenadines. This is a brother who has always played, always been at the vanguard of anything to do with culture, especially relative to indigenous culture here in St. Vincent and Grenadines. He has a job movement in Rosal, Rosal Jaws. He is a positive brother, always about positive vibrations. Greetings, our brother Selim Selwyn Patterson. Give thanks, Mr. Joseph. Blessed love to everyone. Greetings from Rosal. Now, Rosal was the first community to host the Garfuna Conference. And we've been about two years. And um, now, Rosal Jamas. Is more than just a movement. We are also a group. So we are the Youth All Cultural and Development Organization. And we are and the highest village in Sin, the inhabited village in Sin, in San Bernardines. And it was one once where the Garafunas used to be living in a place called Kirkland. Now the Garafuna used to take their journey from Pumbala and pass through a place that we call great and come over to Copeland. Presently, that thing is still there. And what the rules of cultural and development organization is, 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 is promoting now is to have a place built where we can host persons to take them on these tours. We have gotten a partnership with Aileen Getty's foundation where they have donated to us. They have pledged to us 50,000 US to start. We are also looking for 51,000 US to, to complete the project. And in this project, what we are going to do, we're going to have things like tie-dye, basket weaving, drum making. We, we're going to have these indigenous things there. On the 25th of this month, March, is when we are going to have what we call our culture fest. But we are going to have it in a small setting because we don't have any donors. So we are going to do it small. And the Rosal drummers, we are going to be throughout the length and breadth of siblings and Evelines. We have just played in, in a Mekwe two Saturdays ago, where we have done a concert there. We are going to play today. We are going to play on Saturday. We are also going to play in uh, at the Oblis on Heroes Day and at Fancy. And then uh, on the 23rd and the 29th, we are also going to play for the Agriculture Department. So doing these things, we, we are making sure that we carry our Garofuna culture our Garafuna heritage throughout St. Vincent and Grenadines. We're not only playing, but we're also teaching the youths 
parents in Benson. So everywhere we, we, we go, we are making sure that we teach the use. Also, we are talking to Mr. James Rovell. I think he's going to be here soon. And we are planning in August for him to come and stay in Richmond, where he can also teach the Garifuna language, drumming and dancing. So we are working on that. I know that there is a good chat group on it, where we are preparing and and so that we can do it on the legal side, because also the legal side was once where the Garifuna used to live, you know? And I, I think we should also promote that a lot too, because I know Chateau and Fort come up from the legal side, you know, so, so this is the history. So I think we should promote this. And this is what we are doing, because we are going to have a center where we can really promote our Garifuna culture. Give thanks, Miss. Yeah. Thank you, Sally. And we do appreciate your activism. You do this through your activism and your work that these things are happening. And we do wish you all the best with the projects and hope that you see the requisite support. After the 1797 Garfuna exile, Garfuna diaspora is created, and we have Garifuna communities spread across the region. And one of those important communities are located, is located in Guatemala. And we will now hear from our dear sister representing the Garifuna community in Guatemala, Ingrid Gamboa. She will be presented in Spanish and Zoila will be doing the translation. So, Ingrid Gamboa from Guatemala. I can come back to her if she's. Okay, so we will come back to Ingrid and we're trying to locate her on, on the platform. So. What we will do is that to keep the program moving along. The next person who will be bringing students, and this person is incident. She has Vincent roots. Yes, and she now, when we talk about reparations, reparatory, reparatory justice, an important part of that which tends to be overlooked is about healing. How, how do we heal? And this next speaker, she has a program that deals with ancestral healing through meditation and other means. And we now have the opportunity to hear from her as she brings us greetings. So I go now to Miss. Diane Ramos in Canada. Welcome, Diane. Buiti Banafi, thank you so much for welcoming me. And um, I am so excited to be here. I wish I could be there in person. Um, I am Diane Roberts. I'm uh, living in Montreal, uh, Canada, Quebec, Canada. And the indigenous name for uh, Montreal, the Mohawk name for Montreal is Jujake. And that is um, translated as broken in two because it uh, describes the way the river breaks around the island. So I'm on an island as well. It's a much colder island than where you are, um, but, uh, but we are warm in our hearts. Um, I am coming to you um, uh, with an open heart and a curious heart. Uh, I had my first experience of the um, of the uh, Garifuna gathering. I believe it was in 2010, um, and I it's an experience that stays with me. I remember um, being in Rose Hall um, with uh, uh, Brendan Lakai and uh, Zoila and um, David Darkey Williams, 
and um, the community uh, in Rose Hall. And I remember um, at, it was a break after we were doing some theater exercises that Brendan uh, was leading. Um, a gentleman came up uh, behind me. I was standing by an open window. He came up behind me and he whispered in my ear, um, do, did you know that the last Garifuna, Garifuna chief was Jim Roberts? And that could be your ancestor. And I felt at that moment, my body travel outside of me. I couldn't, I had to ask him, sorry, what did you say? I had to ask him to repeat what he said. And um, there was something that awakened in my heart. Um, and this search for my roots and for root cultural practices is my mission, is my mission with my organization, the Arrivals Legacy Project, to bring people to a deeper relationship with their cultural heritage, with their deeper ancestral roots. And I'm so proud to discover my own Garifuna roots uh, via my father, Godfrey Roberts. I'm the daughter of Godfrey Roberts and the daughter of Edna Joseph, the daughter, the granddaughter of Edna Joseph, the granddaughter of, um, of uh, uh, Delmar Roberts, uh, who were all St. Vincentians. So I'm very, very proud to be here to, to send you greetings, to offer my, my undying love for uh, the Garifuna diaspora, the Garifuna who are in St. Vincent. And I look forward to meeting all of you in person at one point or another as I travel through my uh, journey to discover more deeply uh, my Garifuna roots and culture. Now we're in the shout out segment, remember, to attend International Garifuna Conference. The conference officially opens later at 1 p.m. We continue with the shout out segment. The next person to speak to us, she lived here in St. Vincent and been in Yates for a while. She has been a member of the Garifuna Heritage Foundation to which she has given productive service. She is by profession an anthropologist and she really has aided the work of the foundation of its research, especially as it relates to the Garifuna French connection. Let us welcome our dear sister and friend Vanessa Dimension. She's now in the Ivory Coast. Vanessa, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you for having me. Good evening, Marlon. It is so nice to see you. You know that it's a bit bittersweet for me this evening, right? It's actually a particular night because I am normally on the other side with all the Garifuna Heritage Foundation team. And uh, as you just said, it tonight, today it is from Ivory Coast that I am sending you warm greetings. Warm greetings to all of you, to the Garifuna Heritage Foundation team, to all, that I, um, all those I miss daily, those that I know more particularly as well, and everybody attending. Uh, as I was saying, I relocated on the other side of the ocean recently, but mentally, believe me, I am with you today. <laughs> uh, I've had the pleasure to see the conference grow, evolve and adapt throughout the years and the challenges. And I'm really proud. I would also like to applaud the work of the Garifuna Heritage Foundation. And I am grateful for the opportunity to attend online today still. In, despite being far, so this is really appreciated. Most of all, on this special year, I really wish you all the best on this 10th International Garifuna Conference. Thank you.
Garifuna poetess Sao Tome is SK Willingham. She's based in California in the United States of America, and she will be making a contribution. Oh, we're just getting the value to give us a backdrop. Thank you. To give a backdrop. So, F.K. Williams, she is an attorney, attorney, a migration activist, teacher, writer, and a spoken word poet. She has practiced migration law for more than 25 years before becoming a teacher. She is a Garifuna who was born in Punta Gorda, Belize, and raised in Belize City. She emigrated to the United States in the mid-1970s and lived in New York until 2001, then relocated to the San Francisco Bay area where she currently resides. Ms. Williams has performed in many venues over the past 30 plus years in the United States, in the UK, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in South Africa, and Japan. Her poetry has been published in numerous publications in the United States and abroad. Her forthcoming collection of poetry, titled Contemplation, Stamino Contemplando, and Wahuda Ingif, which should be finished Wahuda this will be published this year and 2024, respectively. Ms. Williams is a confounding member of the New York City based Urban Artist Task Force. She received her undergraduate degree at Hunter College City University of New York, her master's degree in African Studies at New York University, and her black degree at Fordham University School of Law. She is currently working on a doctorate in education degree at San Francisco State University. She has three adult children. I now call on Miss F. K. Williams, our full of poetess. Thank you so much. Um, good um, good morning from San Francisco anyway, San Francisco Bay Area. It's still early in the morning here. Uh, 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 for inviting me to par uh, to participate. Um, giving a shout out to everyone. Um, thank you to everyone. Um, I want to dedicate what I'm going to read um, to my Garifuna ancestors um, and also to my parents. My father died a long time ago, but I um, I am a strong uh, Garifuna woman because of my my uh, my ancestors and my parents. Um, so I want to dedicate the reading to them. Um, I wear many hats. You know that was a long bio. I didn't realize that uh, that it would be that long. Um, but I wear many hats, like a lot of women. And um, so I want to shout out the women that are participating and happy belated um, International Women's Day, but also happy Women's Heritage Month. Um, I write a lot. I've been writing for a really long time, and I write a lot about migration. You know, I'm, I've been an immigration lawyer for about 25 uh, to 30 years. And um, but I also write a lot about uh, by Garifuna heritage and about Afro descended aesthetics. Um, so I am going to um, I'm going to read a couple of pieces, and then um, uh, like my bio says, I'm a teacher, so I've got to go. I've got to go um, teach. Uh, I'm going to jump right off and go teach. But um, my first piece, um, I've never been to Saint Vincent, but I'm, I'm connected with all that. My first piece is called Yurume, which is uh, our Garifuna our Garifuna um, name for Saint Vincent Island. Um, so this piece is called Yurume. Our midway between Africa and our New World our intermediate homeland, the place where our hybrid memories began, the place of mixing, the joining of the African and the Arawak, the African and the Carib, Kalipuna, deep in the forest jungles, high up in the mountains, above the clouds, away from our captors, welcomed by the indigenous who shared their languages with us because we'd come from different places and did not have a common one. They shared their cultures, their food, their music, and their love. And we were formed and blossomed into a new people, fierce and proud, Garifuna. And you were our new home, far away from our own. Our new home until we were once again cast out and left adrift to die. 
but we lived and recreated ourselves again, a new people in another new land, with a new language and a different culture, but with you still in our blood. You will be forever in our bones and in our hearts until one day we can go home again. Yurume, the beauty of the rainbows in the valley. We will return with renewed hope and love for the land and the people where the bones of our ancestors lie. Thank you for that one. Um, I am really hoping that um, sometime next year, since the, the hopefully the pandemic will be even less um, uh, at that point, I will get to visit St. Vincent, which I've never been, but I have a lot of dreams about them. And I am also, um, I want to mention, I'm a direct descendant of Joseph Chatouillet. And so, um, you know, I care a lot about, about uh, our culture and our people that way. And I send, uh, um, I feel blessed and lucky to be a part of this program. All right, like I said, um, you know, my father uh, was a very, very strong, um, uh, was a very strong um, man. Um, he was born in Punta Negra in in, uh, in Belize. Uh, he died a long time ago. Um, I, I write a lot about him and the piece is dedicated to him, my dad, uh, Clive Williams. It's called, And I Wept on Sunday Morning. Sunday mornings used to be filled with tiny black legs clad in long white socks, pulled up to ashy knobby knees, tripping, tripping gaily over shiny white patent leather shoes. Mary Jane's maybe? Tiny black hands encased in new white kid gloves, clutching, clutching little vinyl handbags, holding nothing, nothing but a hanky and 15 cents maybe, that little brown button eyes watched wistfully as the silver and nickel coins dropped into long handled wicker baskets in slow motion. Sunday mornings with little dark headed boys in shiny gray suits and white shirts, glistening black shoes, spit shined or polished, hair close cropped, none of their own, pulling pigtails, running, running, hustling at the sound of the church bells ringing over the swing bridge through cast iron gates. Holy, holy, holy Lord. Droning, a droning, droning Lord. The host was always the highlight filling empty stomachs. You couldn't receive the body of Christ in a full stomach. The host would roll down little parched throats into rumbling, rumbling bellies with no wine to wash it down. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Little brown and black legs running, hands clutching, waving goodbye, heading toward the smell of homemade bread. The host would not suffice. Queening toward <laughs> the sound of Simon and Garfunkel on the stereo. There was old Pandy sitting in his taxi nodding off. Should we stop for mischief? The image of a ride on your shoulders in Memorial Park, of the sun glistening on the blue Caribbean sea, running behind Sis on the gazebo gives the answer. Take the green, green grass of home. Sit down to a glass of fresh squeezed orange juice and savor the smell of homemade bread on Sunday morning. But I wept this Sunday morning because I've traded in my long white socks and patent leather shoes for control top pantyhose and high heels and can no longer fit on your shoulders. And Simon and Garfunkel have split up and you are no longer here. Thank you. I'm gonna read two more pieces and then, um, and then I will be done. Uh, this next one is called Transformation. You know, being a Garifuna from Belize, um, we were uh, we we suffered a lot of oppression when I was growing up there in the in the 60s and 70s. Um, and so this piece, Transformation, is about that. Um, and we were the, there was a pejorative uh, used against us called uh, where we were called Carab or Caribbee. So this um, poem is about that word, Transformation. Carab. Though it sounded like cherub the plump brown babies that were the guardians of the soul and the heart that played love games. It was anything but love that the actual word connoted, loaded with hate, loathing and ignorance. It was typically spat out, carob, with vehemence, like so much bitterness from the mouth of the speaker, vile with bile. It was meant to sting and corrode the soul of the recipient, casting him back into the darkness of inferiority where he was told he belonged. And sometimes it did its bidding, burning the heart and soul and pride of the people of the cassava, the people of the plantain, and bimena, and hudutu falmon, and bimekakule, and fish with coconut milk. But in the long run, they did not heed the intention of destruction. And their ancestors before them, like their ancestors before them, they kept going, playing their drums. The heart drum, the primero, the segundo, the tercero, in La Vueva, 
with their ancestors as guests and audience, and family who lay sleeping in hammocks tied one above the other, then waking in the morning to once again continue the ways of their people, rocking and swaying and raising the heartbeat of the Uwayahu, dancing a Mahani and Hungu Hungu and Punta and Wanaragua and sacrificing the Damas and guarding the doors of the temples to keep out evil, either by way of eye or menstrual blood, summoning the ancestors with conch shells from far out to sea, Yurume side, east, waiting, and hoping and praying for the evil word to disappear, taking with it the people who created it. And it did disappear, even though the utterers of the bad word remain. They prevailed, leaving the bad word behind them and became Garinangu, the cassava eaters from Yurume side with their beautiful language and their beautiful customs and their beautiful music that they will dance till the end of time, writhing to the drums on their way back to Yurume from whence they were cast out back to the land of beauty of the rainbows and the valleys and to the realm of our Kalipuna. That's that one. My last piece is called, um, is called Going to the Well. You know, one time when I was growing up uh, in, in Belize, um, I grew up in the city, so uh, you know I lived in a house with water and everything. But my my grandparents and my parents are from um, the south and from the villages, and so there was no water. And so we lived by we lived by a well. Pardon my uh, my alarm. Okay, um, <clears throat> we lived by going to the well. We lived by going to the pipe. So this uh, this piece is called "Going to the Well," even when the well is gone. For those who came before me and left. Mm -hmm. I used to go to the well, then it became the pipe to sit and gossip with the neighbors about who was sleeping with whose man and so on before there was running water to the house. I used to use the outhouse or the bathhouse, each with its own unique smell, shining flies buzzing in and out of my face, concas. The soap sitting on the side running against the too long used wood before water came in pipes from who knows where, bringing itself to the house. I used to wash my clothes outside at the creek at the river in the big wooden bowl carved by my grandfather's hands. I used to grate coconut and green bananas on the wooden greta. I even learned about the egg to grate the cassava to sing the work song that goes with it, Lere Muha Egg. I used to listen to the beat of the drum to celebrate Saturday night or mourn the dead, whom we will remember into eternity. I used to live in a house with a roof made of thatch, with a floor made of mud that I was proud to sweep clean. I used to have to watch for snakes that would crawl into the roof. I would have to protect the young ones from them because snakes too like the sweet smell, the sweet mama's milk, the milk that would linger on the lips of the young. I used to take my swim in the river using sweet hibiscus leaves for both soap and shampoo and dance in the deep dark depths with the myths and the legends that live there. Ishtabai, Tatatuhene, and La Sirena. That was when I was a Garifuna girl with my African and native ancestry all tied up into one. And no one knew how or no one cared why until the legends were invented. I spoke Arifuna in English and Creole and Mayan and Spanish all rolled up into one and did not look to research the reasons to parse myself and find differences. That was before I knew I should be different. That was before I came west and learned about race. Now I no longer haul water from the well or go sit at the pipe and gossip with the neighbors. I do not wash my clothes in a bowel carved by my grandfather's hands. And my ancestors, who used to know how to pound the rice and the hudutu and cook the tikini and catch the fish and sew the tach and go to Arabu and cut the cane and sew the sesame to make wangla and dig the cassava from deep in the earth to take it to the egg to make our precious bread and create the songs and tell the stories of the ancestors and weave the baskets and make the brooms and cut and dry the rita and teach the language to the children and sit on their verandas or in their yards to greet their neighbors who came from the same place at the same time, walking and talking with the same rhythm to say Ida Biangi Namu to answer Ua Diyatige and continue the culture by telling us the stories. Those ancestors are gone, leaving in their wake a hybrid culture peppered with Western influence. Now I live in the North with its coldness of culture, of place, of face, where race is the thing we live by. And stories are told in books, not passed on by word of mouth or dreams trampling upon my Garifuna sensibilities of self, of place, of pace, of race. So I hold on to my oneness with my culture and language and dignity of whom I am, 
so that when the one who stole the land that was once plowed by red hands hisses to me that this is not my birthplace, not my birthright, that I immigrant me has come to take jobs, that I immigrant me must go home, I can, because I have a home, a sense of place, a knowledge of races, a face and roots, a place at the well, a place that I know will welcome me back with my progeny born abroad, not knowing my language or having my sense of place and home. I know I can go back and plant my feet in the soil and know that I can yet again call it home, even though the well is gone, taking with it people that I knew and loved that created the me that is me. I can go home again and start up as if I'd never left, even though many things are new and different and the pipe no longer exists. So I can sit and gossip with the neighbors about who's taken whose woman or man and whose child is not really his. I can go home again, even though the well is gone. Thank you all so much for listening. And I look forward to continuing to uh, participate in this program. As well, the Honorable Carlos James, the Minister of Tourism and Culture. So the next show, so this one is free recording. So we will hand on from Dr. Melanie Newton, who was Hello, good afternoon. My name is Melanie Newton, and I'm an Associate Professor of History at the University of Toronto. And I am a scholar and I think eternal student of Griffin history. Now, I'm really sorry that I cannot be there in person and that I cannot be there uh, live to deliver this message, uh, as I'm going to be teaching when you will be watching this video. So I recorded it ahead of time. I'm really grateful for the honor of being asked to say a few words, and I look forward to a year um, when my work and my parenting responsibilities give me the space to come back in person. I wish to start by acknowledging the Indigenous territory on which I sit as I record this message. My home and my workplace, the University of Toronto, operate on land which is today the city of Toronto, and that city is located on land that has for thousands of years been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. This territory was the subject of the Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between various Indigenous nations to share and care for the land. Today, this meeting place of Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, uh, which is known to many non-Indigenous Americans as North America. And we are all grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I also want to share with you a version of the African Ancestral Acknowledgement, which was created by the Confronting Anti-Black Racism Unit of the City of Toronto, which asks that we acknowledge the ancestors of all of those of us who, who's, who came to this hemisphere involuntarily, particularly, particularly those brought to these lands as a result of transatlantic human trafficking and the enslavement of millions of African people. We pay tribute to those ancestors of African origin and descent. What, do this, what does this conference mean and why is it so important? When I think about that question, I think of the words of Garifuna elder and anthropologist Joseph Palacio, who I met for the first time at this conference. And he has called the Garifuna the quote, quintessential Caribbean people. And that's a truth that I learned when I came to this conference for the first time in 2012. 
on that particular year, we made a pilgrimage to Balaso Island, which was for me the most profound sense of connection that I personally felt to our Caribbean ancestors. It was sad and mournful, yes. And it made me a little angry, that is true, but it was also joyful and beautiful. And it was a true expression of what this conference and the Griffin story mean to us all as Caribbean people. Griffin history and activism are a reminder to pursue, tru pursue truth and learning with an open heart and in a spirit, not just of mourning, but of a deep commitment to anti-colonial pasts, present and future. It brings Indigenous people together to celebrate who they are, but also invites in Caribbean people like me who have no Indigenous ancestry, at least none that I know of, but who yearn always for an understanding of the Caribbean and its people that is not rooted in colonial myths and falsehoods and violence. Iru May or St. Vincent will have been independent for half a century by the end of this decade. And this conference is a reminder to Caribbean governments of their responsibility to make real the promises of decolonization, to pursue reparations as a struggle to bring real freedom, respect, and equality for all of their people. This conference activates those ideas, grounds them in an island that was for centuries a beacon of freedom for Black, Indigenous, and Afro-Indigenous Afro people. The conference is a space for deep thought, for groundings, for sharing, and for celebrating struggles, strength, and survival of our ancestors in the Caribbean. The British, the most powerful empire in the modern world, sought to completely annihilate the Garifuna in the 1790s. And yet here we are being hosted by the descendants of survivors of that catastrophic violence. That history and that story, I think, is for all of us right now at a time of great peril in the world. A reminder that there is always a future, that the future is not written, and that it is in spaces like these, at conferences like these, at gatherings like these, where we get together to speak about and to imagine um, a future where the kind of decolonial um, belief and being um, that Griffin history represents, where that is the spirit that guides governments and guides those in power, and that that is a world we can make if we want. Thank you. Freedom, sit around to do it. Aaron the Mint. Bring greetings from this beautiful country of Chilis, Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Nigeria, and in my car too. It was good to be home. I thank those with the vision as well as obedience, as well as obedience to doing the work that you've been called to do. 
Thank you, Governor from the Heritage. Thank you, Lucia. As keep doing the work that you're doing. Again, my name is Frida Sidero, the president and founder of the Garigna International Indigenous Film Festival. It is to honor our responsibility to ensure our self preservation. And we do that through the media, through films, through our stories that we share, as well as our responsibility to holding a sacred space to ensure our own survival. Yesterday, we were in an amazing environment as we were invited and flown to a neighboring island. When we were flown, so I broke. I broke. We may not or never forget what occurred in Bamso. In order for healing to take place, we must we must speak our truth. And what does that mean to each and every one of us? I mentioned and introduce myself by name. But I am Laborde, I am Cordes, I am Hoyt, and I am Baptiste. <laughs> and so these are the pieces and stories of what ensures that when we are tested and our DNA reminds us and confirms who we are, and when we walk the lands, the birthplace of our ancestors, that we are reminded that we are home. And so we thank you for all of the land and for welcoming us as we are who you are, we are your blood. Thank you. Many blessings and with, with so much love. Thank you, Sister Thera. You know, when she said it is not good to be home, simple statement, but so profound. Imagine over 200 years of exile, and then you come home. Welcome home. All right, so this is where we come to the end. Oh, we have one. Sorry, sorry we have one more free recording. No, she's lying. Oh, she's lying. Okay, so Elizabeth Gamboa, so she is representing uh, Guatemala, her community, and she will be bringing us some greetings. So let us go to Ingrid. Ingrid, she will be speaking in Spanish and Zoila will translate to English. Hermanas, hermanos, Garinaus, the Yurume. Les saludo eh, desde mi comunidad. Eh, Tenemos 221 años de vivir en Guatemala como garífonas. Y aún nos mantenemos vivas como pueblo, como cultura. 
and, and, and we are continuing as people. Yo siento que hay problemas con el sonido, tengo problemas con el internet, la conectividad desde aquí. Disculpas por ello. ¿Me escuchan? ¿Me escuchan? Hello, hello. Again. Hay que arreglar el sonido. Sorry. Bueno, yo decía, voy a, voy a continuar con mi presentación porque hay agenda. ¿Se escucha bien? Oh, muy bien, gracias. Eh, hemos, hemos, hemos estado eh, trabajando muy fuerte para, para que logremos esos 221 años como un pueblo con cultura viva, resilientes. Y por eso hoy, desde la voz del pueblo garífuna de Guatemala, me uno, nos unimos para poder eh, acompañarles en esa inauguración de la décima conferencia internacional garífuna en nuestra cuna ancestral. Eh, lo acompañamos con mucha, con mucha alegría porque somos un pueblo resiliente, somos, somos un pueblo con con mucha fuerza ancestral. Eso es gracias a, a nuestros ancestros, eh, a ese legado que no, no estamos permitiendo ni permitiremos que se desaparezca. Les deseamos muchos éxitos desde acá, desde esta frontera, de esta comunidad garífona guatemalteca, que desde aquí para allá, a nuestra cuna ancestral, estamos acompañándoles eh, en, esa, en, esa, en ese transitar, eh, en esas actividades que están haciendo precisamente para que este legado de nuestros ancestros no se muera. Eh, muchas felicitaciones y muchos abrazos ancestrales eh, desde acá de Guatemala para cada uno de ustedes. Having joined us for our free audience ceremony session where we have shout outs. And this is where we come to the end of the part of the program and we prepare to start with the official opening of the 10th International Garabuna Conference. <laughs> Say thanks to Brother Marlon Gilda for um, a well, I thought well done and for leading us through the first segment of this afternoon's um, activities. My name is Marlon Daniel and I will yeah, both Stuart in um, taking us down to about four or shortly thereafter. And in that way, we invite persons to um, keep their presentations within the um, requested time slots. And um, and those of you who are in cyberspace, so mute your mics um, when you're not making a contribution. Let me, on behalf of the organizer, organizer committee, Welcome you to this um, 10th anniversary celebration of this conference. We began um, around the same um, of the year um, 2012, and we have been doing strong since. I want to first of all acknowledge the presence of the Minister of Education, Gabriel Curtis King, who's here with us, 
the Honorable Minister of Tourism and Culture, Thomas James, the leader of the opposition, Dr. Lauren Friday, somewhere in the audience, yes. Member of Parliament for East Kingstown, the Honorable Fitz Brown, Fitzgerald Bramble, uh, the Honorable Renny Batiste, Speaker of the OECS Assembly. Your Excellencies, the Ambassadors of Cuba and Venezuela and their support staff, and spouses and support staff, thank you. I also wish to recognize my colleagues from the uh, partnering institution, University of the West Indies. I'm so in the presence of my colleague, Mrs. Camille Lacrum, officer in charge of the Open Campus. I also have a um, former head of the Open Campus, Mrs. Lauren Burritas, and of course, our librarian, Ms. Uh, Patricia Lattice, who you might very well be interested in. Um, yeah, with that connection, also there's Renny and a few other um, Batistas around and, and so on. Um, so we will have conversations after. Um, I wish to acknowledge um, senior officers um, in the ministry, both ministries of education and um, tourism and culture. Um, well, it's both online and here in our audience after Lenny and others present us online and here in this sacred space. I want to acknowledge our activists and advocates, our students, both here present and those listening, and all our creatives here this afternoon. And we have been just drawing by our esteemed Commission of Police. Welcome. So welcome one and all. And um, we certainly going to have a wonderful next three days today into Saturday. And we invite you to listen carefully. We invite you to interrogate the material as much as you're able to. It, it will be a lot of material, but we invite you to listen, to ask questions, and to make your clarifications. And so I want to move forward now with our program and invite Ms. Impala come on now. I want now to invite to the uh, sorry, Sister um, Frida, um, you were the earlier, um, Sarah, to bring us the invocation in the um, language, the Arabic language, after which Brother Newton George will bring the invocation in English, after which we will all remain standing for the national anthem of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, what we know as Europe. Please stand. Now, when you added my cousin Janice Coleman, who is a fluent speaker of the Garifuna language. Thank you, Janice, for your support. Bring you on. Bring you on, but she, a damba bay, a fluid, you will be running in the arena room of Kayaba in the Yukuni. Luma, a fluid, you will soon be in Someone <laughs> Now, now, you have many bala, you receive the way we have Wawagua and a name. I'm a gumocha, whatever the room won't go again. Which way we will go Lao Guma Meme Bala Badiwa La Guma 
Ruba, Ruba, Fulessi, Magumu Chaguality, Ligia Wom. Cafenti Bulwa was you, Wabura men, to who did he hear boom, Kate, Tima La, or Mary Ruby? Mammy, Casey, Adaha Baniwa, no one woman, no one did the harm, no Wadun Wabu Bena. Which one name? Wamuria Ham, be you with him. Baruba, I assume Garina will lead on Abba, Adam with Dagoni, lay good at Hara Abba, Parasa Habu, Lao, leading Ruba, and each of you know my Pussy won't know Wagarani Ham, no God at you. Wagia, Abba, Abba, Wagia, soon will run. I do the balloon, who see now, near to one. Who may get the abbey? In your home, one may speak with the one may man. Larry will move home, was sunny. Either by or was sunny, you know, Panta Hama, Lao, Hathe, Hathe Yanuna. Buddha had your man, how old? Oh, sir, how may soon wait to live? New waiting home. I look at her year, man, not now. Let Lutti la Seri Dunya Seri Lion Man, again. I do him. Rabula home. Wabrin Roa, either a bow again and no. Wawaki Imaritum, Harry. Mabucha the year, man. Wawaki, also a soon there. But there was a bay woman, no, neither one even, no one knew how we do men so much. A moral one of these. Why <laughs> I know how Amuria Hawamti soon led Nita again, Hesu Christ, well, we be reading Wasabaraha, led Abaga Ruba, Buma, or Luma, Afro Bumu Fuliti, Luma again, Tita again, Wabuch, no Maria Bingo, or Wabu the Wame, Gay, Wakre, Wabureme, Luma Hayumaha, Ha Hari, Wayuna. Ah, 
A lot of the powerful people I have come between you and your people to me to make intercession. Father, we thank you for being the root of many branches will banish the body soul and then migrate to the elsewhere. So we gather here at this opening ceremony of the 10th International Garapuna Conference. And help us to converse with one another, and to plan with one another, so that when we leave this conference, we will not be reactive people, but active people, re-establishing the Garifuna government in our homeland. Father, we have such a rich culture, and we thank you for it. Our fishers, our fishermen, our farmers, our boat builders who build boats, your car full of people who travel from here to Trinidad, Guyana, Aruba, elsewhere in the Caribbean. Help us to regain our culture, our cultural religion, our cultural economical system and government. Father, let's the rest of this conference and let us Thank you as I bring to you freedom, freedom, freedom. Once a free land in the West, a land of the bliss. Spanish and French pirate wanted us. British invaders wanted us to. The victor apprehended us. Then we will colonize. Colonization breeds oppression, man by man exploitation and pollution. Religious confusion, frustration and temptation. Lord, come liberation. To my children, I cried, I'm going to evade. Eviction came in 79, twice a nation just in time. Invasion of my sister land. And drop my words in when in sun. Foreign intervention, not me, never my intention. Nation building and independence to my children, I stands. Youths of today, flowers of tomorrow, the future is left to you. Carry on, carry on, my people. A progressive life in peace. Walk on, walk on, my children. World peace, our goal. Freedom, freedom, freedom. Thank you. Our uh, invocation in Yamatu. We now have the anthem and we invite um, Sister Eureka Gates to lead us in the anthem. Now 
along with the program who I invite the presence of the Telephone Heritage Foundation. I just wish to acknowledge the presence of our um, Chief Federal Officer, Ms. Maxine Brown, somewhere in the audience, stepped in while we were in the um, kitchen. Brother um, David Williams to bring us to work on behalf of the Telephone Heritage Foundation and its partnering That protocol for today has been read out, and uh, I consider it being being established. I will proceed to seek your approval for those of you those. Who makes up that um, protocol list? Um, I think you have to go to adopt. And move on. The regulations are in order for all groups and individuals who have made. Uh, contribution was making the month of March an important period of citizenship and national pride for concessionists. Along with August and October, I'm coming from our unique and particular colonial status. These three months of the year gives us ample opportunities to dig deep into our, our history in order to devise activities that observe important events, that commemorate important dates, and 
and most times we do so those observances and those commemorations during holidays. At this time though, I would like to bring the public notice today. Today, March 9th. As we go through the annals of Gaiful history and expound on the various aspects of the Gaiful culture and our own traditions, we will find that the 9th of March 1797 is the date on which the so called Black Arabs of St. Vincent were taken off the island of Baliso as prisoners of war and taken to the island of Rota in the Bay of Honduras. Now, I, this is not a call coming from the Garifuna Heritage Foundation or from me personally. This is not a call for um, another date to be made a public holiday. It is just that in the process of commemorating things relative to the history of St. Vincent and the Bernadines, and specifically the Garifuna history and the Garifuna culture, let us please remember this date. We have enough holidays for my part, so I won't advocate for another one. This conference comes at a time when the debate on reparations for slavery and for native genocide is gaining renewed momentum and even though it's a slow, it's gaining continuing traction. And that is happening not just in the Caribbean, but across the world. And we are already beginning to witness the minuscule tokens coming in. Um, still coming as um, those symbolic gestures of or from the some troubled conferences by private individuals, as well as one or two radical expressions of intent by owners and others of an entity whom we in the Caribbean could, in the modern Caribbean, that is, could hardly live without. And those owners, perhaps of exceptionally large businesses, has come out front in a very radical fashion to makes out their statements concerning reparations. And we would like to put on record those reparations take into consideration the indigenous peoples of this region. Oops some special, special provisions should be made for our indigenous peoples. With those few remarks, I want to welcome you to the proceedings of this 10th International Garifuna Conference and hope that things that are exchanged here 
ideas that are put forward over the next two and a half days here would serve the Vincentian public, the Vincentian people, the Vincentian nation in good stead. And we hope that these deliberations would turn a new page in the way forward as far as reparations for native genocide and slavery flows in the Caribbean. Thank you for coming and enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much, Brother David, uh, President of the Garifuna Heritage Foundation here in Citizens. And we welcome now our youngsters from the Clare Valley. Um, sorry. Um, okay, so this is C.W. Prescott Primary. Sorry, I, I had something different. But we welcome you nonetheless to um, make a present a cultural presentation. Please welcome you. Hey, <laughs> Why Thank um. 
I'm going to put on the sunway a glass of one one way or two. Okay. Um, so I'm going to put on the sunway a glass of water. I'm going to put on the sunway a glass of water. I'm going to put on the sunway a glass of water. I'm going to put on the sunway a glass of and um, they participated in that um, um, festival and won Prescott. So thank you very much, CW Prescott, Brian Soul. It's now my pleasure to invite my colleague, um, officer in charge of the Open Campus, Mrs. Camille Lacron, just to um, to bring you remarks. Um, the Open Campus, well, the University of the West Indies, in this case, the Open Campus is a partner within this conference and so we are always pleased to um, bring you greetings and remarks. This is Larry. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me conclude on the protocol already established. Over the years, the various conferences highlighted the many intriguing facets of the Garakuna heritage and culture, and explored avenues to ensure that they remain and retain their relevance in our modern society. We became immersed in hitherto unknown history, were exposed to the spoken language and music, and gained a new appreciation for the struggles for the right to survive of our forefathers. The UNESCO declarations of 2001. 2019, and the creation of the labels Masterpieces of the Oral and the Tangible Heritage of Humanity allowed us to declare to the world that we hold a legitimate claim to the riches and magnificence of our indigenous cultural heritage. This year's theme, From Reaction to Action, Challenges and Opportunities for Promoting Reparative Justice for Indigenous People, represents a shift in focus from being celebratory to seek and redress for egregious historical wrongs in a manner that both preserves that heritage and provides educational and economic opportunities for present and future generations. The economic gains of the then first world countries at the expense of indigenous peoples are well documented, significantly so by their historians. The Garakuna descendants scattered across Belize, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Honduras, Tibet, and the Belize, European and the diaspora share a common experience of economic and social vulnerability and deprivation. Caracol started the process in 2013, 10 years ago, with the launch of the CRC, the Caricom Reparations Commission to address the issue of reparations from European powers for slavery and indigenous genocide. The world continues today in this conference, and I'm heartened by the geographical and academic breadth of this year's presentations. We are still here not alone. The University of the West Indies has endorsed the right to reparatory justice at the highest levels, and we as a citizen society. I'm extremely proud to collaborate with the local Garakuna Heritage Foundation in this and our future generations. We wish the organizers, presenters, advocates, ascendants, and all involved a successful conference with meaningful outcomes that will inform the way forward. For our visitors, I will so much welcome. Thank you all.
Thank you very much, Mr. Malcolm, for those words. And of course, as you are aware, the University of the West Indies is moving a little faster than some of the governments, but we all get in there. Um, and so I'm proud to be a part of the institute, and that is um, out front, globally, um, making the charge on, on this matter, very important matter of reparations. Thank you, Mrs. Lacker. Before the minister comes to make his remarks, um, I have the pleasure of inviting uh, Brother Shane Wynn to uh, make a presentation. Um, I know our friends in Europe are, have been waiting for a while, so just about seven in Western and Central Europe. Uh, 12 o'clock in Belize and uh, just about 2 o'clock here. We, we do it well, so we will get there. <laughs> Well, in the pre-focalness, and there's several instruments, but I think he masters the the the. Welcome. Similarly, multiple your roommate. Darina Go, Sarah Wama, Chulu Hada, Lida Abba. Who do a man who was funny in the dark? Came over a bottle of wine. My people. Let's get up. It's time to unite. Let us raise our flags together proudly. My people don't forget our sad experience. What's up? Awa suba 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 haya nega noto. Haya nega noto. Thank you. And um, I was tempted, but I, I didn't want to bring it up on the description. In twenty sometime in twenty eleven, I'm reminded. I think I may have gone to one of one one or two sessions, but we had some colleagues, our brothers and sisters, you know, from Belize and New York. And Shane participated in one such summer program. 
think from the things to off. And it's amazing how he has um, matured um, just for that one experience um, that um, wet his curiosity. Uh, so we give thanks to James Lovell and Eleanor Bullock and their teams who started this process in 2011. Subsequently, others have come out of the New York area and police and have done um, uh, various aspects of the history, particularly language, also the dance and the drums and so on. So thank you very much, and um, we really do appreciate that. It's my pleasure to welcome the Minister of Education to bring some brief remarks on behalf of his ministry, and who in his own right is a historian as well. It's my pleasure to my current authorities to our history. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's the last ceremonies. The current Minister of Culture, Carl Schrins, the leader of the opposition, Dr. Uh, Friday, and it's Bramble, and it's for the same Ladies and friends, comrades from Cuba and Venezuela, spouses, other distinguished ladies from the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Culture, Police Academics. It is indeed a pleasure to be here this afternoon, and I couldn't help reflecting the very early days of this event and how it has to start so that to be we so, want also to recognize very unique style of presentation of course the flowers of our nation students from the city of Christmas and the community. Thank you. Seven oh, seven will be up on Indigenous peoples in the region play a significant role in our historical development. And we always have to recognize the role of our local government. So a very so sisters, almost ten years ago, the Caricom. Preparations Commission was launched very year in St. Vincent and Wales. And of course, we felt great because our government and country played a significant role in that event. The Commission brought together Caribbean people 
from all sectors of our regional community. Academics, astrophysicians, politicians, society practitioners, governments. Its primary mandate was and remains to quote from its laws of reference to establish moral, ethical, and legal case for the payment of reparations by the governments of the former colonial powers, relevant institutions in these countries, to the nations and the people of the Caribbean community for the crimes against humanity of native genocide, the chance of life century, and a re and a racialized system of chapter state. The execution of its mandate, the Commission has adopted a CARICOM preparatory justice program. This program outlines a 10 point plan that the Commission believed in a necessary path to progress on the issue of reparation. The plan is not simply an assessment of the cost of reparations in dollars and cents. It is more a comprehensive plan that speaks to the issues of reconciliation, truth, and justice for the victims and their descendants of the people of the Caribbean who was subjected to colonialism, racialism, slavery, and so on. The program for the victims and their descendants to be financed by the governments, or if you like, the people, or the financial institutions of those countries that are responsible for the legacy of underdevelopment inherited by our Caribbean nations, and which is still impacting negatively the region's development efforts. Point number three of the plan speaks directly to the native Caribbean people including the Philippines, it calls for a development plan for the Native Caribbean people in response to the genocide and land appropriation suffered by the people of this community. Since the establishment of the Caribbean Operations Commission, significant progress has been made in terms of, no, in terms of the promotion of reparatory justice for persons of African descent and the native population of the Caribbean. It is discussed and debated in the international forum, in the capitals of, form, of the former colonial nations in Europe, is discussed in Africa, and of course, several international organizations, including the United Nations. Some institutions in Europe have been offering apologies. Some of them have gone so far as to pledge preparation payments. There is not a little doubt that the reparation movement has been re-energized since the establishment and launch of the Caribbean Reparations Commission. But we must not become convincing. There is still a significant number of our people who demonstrate a lack of interest 
and in some cases, outright opposition to the campaign for reparations. Despite letters sent by our governments to several European governments, inviting them to commit dialogue on reparations, they have thus far refused, I would say they have to refuse to engage our leaders in such dialogue. The fact is, it is fair to conclude that these and other persistent challenges still confront the reparation movement today. But in the midst of these challenges, there exist opportunities that can be exploited and used for advancing us. An often overlooked fact is that today's world, not in the environment in which we live today, seems to be more receptive to issues of preparatory justice. Our task is to find creative ways of exploiting such opportunities while at the same time coming up with creative ways to overcome the challenges and faces. That is to say, we have to develop strategies that will allow us to move from mere reaction to real action. You have a, a some, you have assembled quite an impressive group of participants to address this issue. So I have no doubt that your deliberation over the next couple of days will be successful. However, greater success will be dependent on your ability to act on the many ideas and recommendations that will come out of your deliberation. I therefore wish to conclude by first congratulating the local Garfuna Heritage Committee of Foundation Summary and the UWI. And, and I was going to say, oh, Ben Pampas, I'm not sure if I should say Ben Pampas. You're welcome. Yes, UWI, you're welcome. For working together, put together. Let me say that this conference over the years has generated great information for the education sector. And it has made a significant contribution to what our people know about Garifuna and culture. So, in a sense, throughout these various conferences, we have been informed significantly about our cultural heritage, especially as it relates to our Garifuna people. And I therefore want to thank all the organizers significantly and to pledge the Ministry of Education continued support for this activity and for future activities organized by both the Global Campus of UAE and the Heritage Foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister King, for those um, um, brief um, remarks and for the information shared. Um, I'm also reminded as well that um, Trisha Sintil um, played a very critical part um, in, in the development of, of what you see here in terms of the cultural aspect, culture and, and the language 
the bands, the drum, the music, etc. And I remember, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Trisha also sent books to uh, one of our literary fairs some years ago. So, um, so even from afar, um, our brothers and sisters are, are making their contributions to the development of the cultural landscape and the um, knowledge base um, as it regards to our history. So thank you very much. Um, and so, um, I know we should invite our um, uh, performers from the Clare Valley uh, Primary School, and they will do something called, well, the title of the presentation is Madison. So let's welcome them now.
So I'll just invite, I'll just invite the um, teacher just to say a few words. Um, Good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, Good to wrap my wheel. I am coming from the Clare Valley Government it's School. Fortunately for us, sometime in last year, we had a team um, coming from the Middle East with Dr. Blue, um, Dr. Right. Gwen Nunes, uh, but I think she never shot out earlier. Yes, so thank you to our team. You are able to do this presentation today, and the students were very much involved, especially with the drumming. They were able to learn a number um, of things to say in Garakuna, and it was through them that we were able to do this presentation today. So, thanks for being here. Thank you very much. It's so beautiful, Dan. And I now have the pleasure to be with the Minister of Tourism and Culture, the Honorable Anna Street. So, when you can hear us, I am going to ask this activity. Let us go to the Thank you very much, Ronnie. You can send greetings to parliamentary colleagues who are here with us today. Speaker of the OECS Assembly, the Honorary Matisse, the Cuban and Venezuela Ambassadors, Your Excellencies and your spouses, welcome. Presidents and Representatives, Garifuna, Council of Organizations who are here. Present with us today, and unfortunately, the University of the West Indies, academics, other distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, we recognize also the Commissioner of Police who's here with us, as well as the Permanent Secretary of the Commission for the Nation. It is indeed a pleasure to stand here to. Welcome all of you, some of you who have met in the last three years, virtually during the, of the pandemic, we've had the conference virtually, and some of you may not have been able to meet the Samuel Hill who home to St. Vincent in the Rendings, and Yuri, as you affectionately call it. So I officially welcome you back home. And it's good to extend these greetings from there in person. We look at this tenth conference, addressing a number of important topics and the conversations around the preparatory justice. And particularly, when we are about the agenda for indigenous peoples across the world, those who are descendants of our native indigenous peoples, Tarifuna, Palinado, they stand here in Europe. And how do we present a case that is compelling, one that is sound academically and scientifically, and also important legally? And how do we present and we put this in the global context of reparations and the importance of correcting, most importantly, wrong, and also importantly, having a formal, full apology to native genocide and the atrocities which was caused upon the people of or indigenous Europe. We 
Most Let's go back in context to our past. <laughs> From the struggles of a free people to the period of colonialism and where we have emerged as a Caribbean civilization, and I'm going to the Caribbean civilization. They are Carrefour descendants also in the Americas, in North America, in Europe, and other places. But we're all part of and parts of the Caribbean civilization. And how we create this Caribbean civilization fashion from the fabric of our social distinctiveness as a people. We do this through our collective exercise of intellect, imagination, or creativity in the form of drumming, dance, the art form, and the several expressions that connect us no matter where you are in the world. Connect us back home in Europe. Connect us back to our ancestors. And we do all of these things in the context of the challenges that we have emerged from, who appeared sleep, and of course. What we will consider to be one of the harsh actions taken by the indigenous people of Europe. We'll spend some time here from leaving inland to Mariso, where many of them suffered, died, and then later transferred to other parts of. These South American and Caribbean basin leaves in Guatemala and Jurassic. <laughs> when you look at the post colonial period, and you look in context of all civilization, and it's on the development. Though we have had the strides and successes, the Syrian people, if you look at the challenges in education, when we talk all political independence, here's a Vincent and the news. You look at the institutions that were built by our colonizers. There are only two major schools. When you look at our current health conditions, and you look at not just in St. Vincent, but look at the Americas, descendants of slaves and our indigenous people and you look at the high rates of non-communicable diseases the exports are telling us the generational connection and the causal link with diets of molasses and Salt and contents of <laughs> and how that is impacting and all generations. <laughs> you look at Britain in particular, and in today's value, you enslaved after the period. 
of slavery. For simply said, well, you're free. But those who were the colonizers were compensated to the value for billion dollars in Kitty's heart. And you bring into context all of these challenges, but yet you find collectively our people, our resilience, and where we are today, and the challenges that we have overcome. We have clearly established. In my mind, several propositions for reparations, particularly for enslaved and indigenous peoples, particularly from St. Vincent and the Grand Region. And we have to take steps such as what we're doing in this conference, the starting point. To continue the dialogue, continue the message. I'm ensuring that reparations remain at the forefront of the political agenda in the global context. So, Vincent, that we were meetings through our Prime Minister, Dr. John Rabbi himself, and Samuel address. In conference later this week, we want to be leading political figures at the United Nations, championing the call for reparatory justice. Here in Vincent and the Brazilians, we continue to grow back by declaring this month of March. National Heroes Month, Heritage Heroes Month, a kind of activities. Please, at the very forefront, His Excellency Lord of Chate will force national human. You saw the many students who performed here, in the exchanges, the cultural exchanges, transfer of knowledge, focus on the arts, dance, music, language, our lost language. We've placed significant emphasis to ensure that we place it in the context of our schools, elements of our learning. We've started, and I note here with us, Dr. Denny. We've panelled a number of local historians and academics. You see Dr. Dorsey as well, who has begun the process of compiling a series of information that will be put into a context for the production of transcript, which we will call Kishimitsu Bits in ruled by all people, doing all research, all Not from reading the journals, and copy and go with him. The governors, slave masters, the captain of the ships during the period of slavery. But we will do our own research. And we will tell our own story. So we get to the family for our generations to come. It's an important and undertaking that we're going back to in this country. I want to share with you just briefly and conclude that reparatory justice is just not 
the monetary context of rewriting the wrong with financial compensation. But it captures several different things. Borrowing from the 10 point plan in CARICOM, I mentioned the public health crisis, which we was going more details. Cultural institutions, where we've lost a significant part of our culture. The developmental program for indigenous peoples, and importantly, a full formal apology for the many atrocities caused for the enslaved and our indigenous people. I hope that we can use this conference, this tenth conference, to build on all of the hard work over the many years to develop a comprehensive plan that has a firm and compelling legal and sound argument in which we can move even for the overcall of a reparatory justice. The hard work that we do now, some of us will not live to experience the outcome of the hard work that we're doing. But we do it with the children, the future of Europe. The ones who are coming behind us, we tell our story, we make the call for reparations, and we set the platform for our future generations to benefit from this undertaking. I want to end here by wishing all of you and extend my congratulations to the local Garifuna Foundation, the University of the West Indies, and all of the hard work in behind the organization of this conference. It's an important one that has very strong agenda, which this government has taken note of and has placed high on its priority within the month of management. All month, heroes and heritage. We want to thank you and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Mr. Jesus, for the remarks. I'm worried that we must start with a connection with the world that is taking place in the world. This is my friend, my friend, my friend, my friend, um, there was our drummers. I'm going to come. I'm going to come with you. 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 Jesus, are you not ready? Are Yes, I you to
Thank you very much, Rosa, for your contribution. And by the response, you know that you felt it. Thank you very much, Rosa. We are now moving along with the program. And we will now have uh, some remarks from a partner at the University, the University of um, California. Um, is it recorded or? Yes. Yes. Uh, 
Good morning. My name is Beth Rose Middleton Manning, and I'm a professor in the Department of Native American Studies at the University of California, Davis. I'm honored to be able to greet you today, and I hope you are having a wonderful conference. Back in 2012, I was able to attend the conference and to begin building a partnership with Zoila Ellis to develop a curriculum on Indigenous Caribbean or Caribbean indigeneity. Our first step, uh, besides building relationship and assessing what the needs were, was getting a sense of what curriculum was out there at universities in the United States and Canada that dealt with Indigenous Caribbean. We found very little. Uh, we found a few courses that dealt with African and Indigenous intersections in the Caribbean, uh, but mostly historical, um, nothing really contemporary, no courses that were specifically on Garifuna people Griffin of history, Griffin identity, etc. Uh, this was pretty powerful for us and also really drew out the need to develop this type of curriculum so that students can learn about Griffin of people and about African and Indigenous intersections in the Caribbean and about Caribbean indigeneity broadly. So um, I should also say in our Department of Native American Studies, we are relatively unique because we have a hemispheric perspective. So we try to think about intersections and engagements between indigenous peoples throughout the hemisphere from the tip of South America to the Arctic and also engagements with indigenous peoples from other places including Oceania, Africa uh, and Asia. And so our department is a good place for developing this Caribbean indigeneity focused curriculum. So in the years since 2012, I received a small grant from our college, from our dean's office, as well as from our Office of Global Affairs. And that grant enabled us to do a number of things. I hired some students, undergraduate and graduate, as research assistants. I will say all of these students are either African-American or Native American women, and they work to assess what, what is out there and to begin developing curriculum. And throughout this process, we've had ongoing dialogue with Zoila. She's been a wonderful partner. We've developed lists of books, articles, um, maps, offices, policies that should be included in this type of curriculum. And we've also been excited to think about how might this curriculum not only be used in the states and particularly at University of California, but how could it be used in St. Vincent, um, maybe working with the University of West Indies. So I'm very excited to explore that angle and how do we make a curriculum that faces multiple directions in order to provide more holistic education, in-depth context around Caribbean indigeneity. Also, we developed and offered a pilot course in fall 2020 uh, remotely because it was during the pandemic. We had probably about a dozen students enrolled. It was a freshman seminar. Zoila spoke. We had speakers who were from throughout the Griffin diaspora. We delved into a variety of topics, including climate change, reparations, economic development, language, arts and literature, music, uh, history, and political context. That was very successful. And and just really provided a nice opportunity to develop a pilot, which we're now building out to how would this look as a undergraduate course um, that could be offered either online or in person from our Department of Native American Studies. And as I mentioned, very excited to explore how we might develop a partnership with entities in St. Vincent and in the Southeastern Caribbean and in other places as well. We've also been able to attend some conferences together. We attended a bilingual or trilingual conference in Mexico City about indigeneity in the Americas. Uh, we're getting ready for the NISA, Native and Indigenous Studies Association, which all of these opportunities, uh, also Caribbean Studies Association, have enabled us to grow our learning about what materials are out there? What's the new scholarship coming out around Caribbean indigeneity, around Garufana indigeneity, history and language? And how can we develop that, add that to our curriculum? And how can we participate in these conversations to grow understanding of the region, support for issues um, that the communities are dealing with, including the questions of reparations and also dealing with climate change and its impact on cultural places. So that's one aspect of our partnership. I'll also say that growing out of my personal experience at the conference, I attended in St. Vincent in 2012, and my own work on conservation and funding cultural conservation with Indigenous partners, 
I was able to learn about Baliso and worked on an article that came out in Caribbean Studies Quarterly about various potential ways to use conservation mechanisms to fund protection of um, Baliso. So I hope to continue to be engaged in that work as well. I'm grateful to meet you. I wish that I could be there in person and I commend you on this wonderful conference and I look forward to further engagement in the future. Thank you. We wish her all the best in all her future endeavors. This we love you. Uh, we now move into the other part of the last the introduction of the keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Federico Lanzarini. Professor Federico Lanzarini is a professor of international law and human rights at the Department of Political and International Sciences of the University of Siena, Italy. He is also professor at the Masters of Law program in intercultural human rights at the St. Thomas University School of Law, Miami, Florida, USA. 
Professor at the Tulane Siena Summer School of International Law, Cultural Heritage and Governance. Deputy Head of the Hawaiian Kingdom's Royal Commission of Inquiry and member of the Academic Friends of the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous People. He has been consultant to UNESCO, consultant to the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for international negotiations related to cultural heritage and member of the Italian delegation at meetings of the World Heritage Committee. He has been the rapporteur of the Committee on the Rights of Indigenous People of the International Law Association, rapporteur of the International Law Association Committee, Com Committee on the Implementation of the Rights of Indigenous People. He has provided several consultancies to Indigenous communities around the world. He is the delegate of the Rector of the University of Siena of Italy, for students and researchers coming from crisis areas, and director of the Inter-University Center for Research on Human Rights and Immigration Law at the University of Siena. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll give you our keynote speaker, Dr. Federico Lenzerini. Please welcome. Can you hear me? Okay, I suppose that everything is in good order. Thank you very much for your very warm presentation. And thank you also for thinking about me for participating in this conference. It is really an honor and a pleasure for me. My presentation is about using international law for promoting reparatory justice for indigenous peoples and their members in the Caribbean. Please let me share my presentation. Okay. Well, uh, one very important concept when it comes to the, the lifestyle of indigenous peoples is the one concerning the circle of life. For indigenous peoples, the circle of life represents a strong, sacred, powerful symbol incorporating all the basic foundations of life. It symbolizes the interdependence among all forms of life and things and how all entities move toward their destiny. Reparation for past wrongs represents an essential step in the process of recognition, concretization and consolidation of the rights of indigenous peoples within the international legal regime. In the circle of life, which characterizes the existence of most indigenous communities, there cannot be a decent future if the present has not resolved what went, went wrong in the past. As regards the concept of reparations or redress, they represent the healing process consisting in curing the wounds opened by the wrongs suffered in the past. These wrongs for indigenous peoples produce strong intergenerational implications. It is for this reason that reparations are fundamental in view of restoring the order and harmony of the secular life as existing prior to the wrong. Reparations are decisive in order to guarantee the preservation of indigenous peoples as distinct cultural communities and eventually the perpetuation of their very physical existence. Now, uh, international law on indigenous peoples is relatively new. At present, there are three main instruments dealing specifically with the rights of indigenous peoples. The first one in chronological terms is the ILO Convention 169 of 1989 concerning indigenous and tribal peoples in independent countries. The next instrument is a declaration which is very well known. I'm talking about the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2007. Finally, the most recent of the three relevant instruments is the American Declaration 
on the rights of indigenous peoples adopted by the Organization of American States in 2016. Now, all these instruments uh, have in their text provisions on reparations. As regards International Labor Organization Convention number 169, we have first of all Article 12 stating that indigenous and tribal peoples shall be safeguarded against the abuse of their rights and shall be able to take legal proceedings either individually or through the representative bodies for the effective protection of these rights. Uh, there is no explicit reference to reparations in this provision, but uh, it is clear that it implicitly presupposes a right to reparation for the wrong suffered, even though the formulation of the provision seems to ex exclude that it can be considered applicable retroactively, that is to say, to wrongs occurred before the entry into force of the Convention. However, several ILO committees have recognized that the Convention is applicable to situations occurred much before its entry into force when past wrongs have ongoing effects effects which continue to be produced today. And this is the case for most wrongs suffered by indigenous peoples in the past. So this is a very important implication for the reason that uh, the way of life of indigenous peoples imply, as I previously said, that most wrongs suffered in the past continue to produce implications at the intergenerational level. In ILO Convention number 169, it is also important Article 15, Paragraph 2, providing for the right of indigenous and tribal peoples to receive fair compensation for any damages on their traditional lands arising from the exploitation of mineral or subsurface resources present in the territory. Uh, last but not least, Article 16 is important and it refers to the relocation of indigenous communities from their traditional territories. Uh, this relocation is in principle prohibited, but when it is absolutely indispensable, the members of indigenous communities who have been relocated shall be fully compensated for any uh, resulting loss or injury. However, we have to say that at present, among Caribbean countries, only Dominica has ratified ILO Convention number uh, 169. Let us move to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, this instrument uh, is plenty of provisions concerning reparations or redress. We have Article 8, Paragraph 2, concerning breaches that threaten the cultural identity and integrity of indigenous peoples is a, a very wide article in terms of uh, its uh, application, applicability, for the reason that it deals with any kind of situation which is suitable or threatening the cultural identity of indigenous communities. According to Article 11, indigenous peoples have also a right to reparation with respect to their cultural, intellectual, religious, and spiritual property taken without their free, prior, and informed consent or in violation of their laws, traditions, and customs. A right to reparation, according to Article 20, also exists when indigenous communities are deprived of their means of subsistence and development. According to Article 32, a right to redress exists for damages determined by projects affecting the lands or territories and other resources belonging to indigenous communities which determine adverse environmental, economic, social, cultural, or spiritual impact. Last but not least, probably the most important provision concerning reparations included 
in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is Article 28, providing for a right to reparations for the lands, territories, and resources which indigenous peoples have traditionally owned or otherwise occupied or used, and which have been confiscated, taken, occupied, used, or damaged without their free, prior, and informed consent. Uh, this provision, uh, as, I, uh, as I just said, is particularly relevant for the reason that, despite the fact that it was the object of a uh, very, uh, a, a very vivid debate during the uh, preparatory works leading to the adoption of the declaration, today it seems that there is no reasonable doubts on the fact that this provision is applicable retroactively. That is to say, to wrongs concerning lands, territories, and resources suffered by indigenous communities even before the adoption of the declaration. This has been confirmed, among others, by the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples. The preferred means of reparation, according to this provision, is restitution of the territories and resources concerned, but it is not mandatory because we know very well that in some cases it is not factually practicable. Uh, I repeat that all the provisions I have referred to are included in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the UNDRIP. And it may be interesting to say a few words on the legal significance of this declaration, because you know very well that differently from a treaty, a declaration is not technically binding for states, even though uh, when the General Assembly of the United Nations decides to adopt the Declaration of Principles, uh, its contents uh, are related to the Charter of the United Nations in some way or other. And so for this reason, there is a very strong moral duty for member states of the United Nations to comply with the provisions of a Declaration of Principles. Anyway, uh, of course, during the history of the United Nations, several declaration of principles have been adopted by the General Assembly, and some of them have played a, a, a much bigger impact on the development of international law than others. This is the case, among others, of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, for a number of reasons. First, has been generally acknowledged as the instrument of reference to define state obligations existing in the field of indigenous people's rights, especially by human rights treaty bodies, which in practice have considered some of the provisions included in the declaration as binding for states. Further, the legal significance of the UNDRIP has been recognized by domestic courts and, in some cases, political bodies of several states. Some countries, including, for instance, Bolivia, the Republic of Congo, and recently Canada, have incorporated the provisions of the Declaration into domestic laws. Others, including, for instance, Ecuador and Salvador and Kenya, have modified their constitutions to make them consistent with the UN Declaration. Not to mention the many domestic judgments issued also by Supreme Courts, uh, confirming the legal significance of the Declaration as going much beyond what is commonly recognized with regard to the Declaration of Principle. For instance, just to to provide one example, in 2014, the Supreme Court of Belize held that the Declaration obliges the national government to respect the rights of the indigenous Maya peoples to their lands, territories, and resources which they have traditionally owned, occupied, or otherwise used or acquired, and to obtain reparation in the event of breaches. Last but not least, 
the adoption of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of, the, of Indigenous Peoples has strongly contributed to the formation and consolidation of rules of customary international law concerning Indigenous Peoples' rights. Among these rules, one concerning right to reparations is to be included. Uh, the third instrument uh, to which I have referred is the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which also includes at least four provisions concerning reparations and redress, very similar to some uh, previously included in the UN declarations. Uh, as regards customary international law, you know that it, it is particularly important because when uh, a provision of customary international law exists concerning a given topic, it means that it produces obligations for all countries in the world. Of course, uh, they are not obligations of absolute character, but unless there is a very strong reason allowing a state to derogate from them, there is a legal obligation for all countries to fully comply with provisions of customary international law. Among these provisions, it has been recognized, for instance, by the International Law Association Committee on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, that under customary international law, indigenous peoples have the rights to reparation and redress for the wrongs suffered. And this right, as I previously said, amounts to a rule of customary international law to the extent that it is aimed at redressing a wrong resulting from a breach of a right that is itself part of customary international law. So a right to reparation exists inherently, for instance, when there is a violation of land rights or right to self-determination or right to autonomy and self-government, which are also sanctioned by rules of customary international law. This is for the reason that redress is an essential element for the effectiveness of human rights. In particular, it has been recognized that states must comply with the obligation, according to customary international law, to recognize and fulfill the right of indigenous peoples to reparation and redress for the wrongs they suffered. In particular, when their lands have been taken or damaged without their free, prior, and informed consent. Effective mechanisms for redress established in conjunction with the people's concern must be available and accessible in favor of indigenous peoples. Now, so far I have, uh, uh, I have shown the existence of a number of rules both of treaty, uh, soft, and customary international law. Of course, you know very well that for a rule to be effective, it is not sufficient that it is written on a legal instrument. For how important these legal instruments may be. Uh, the most important thing in order to make a, a rule, especially in the human rights field, effective in the life of people is that they are concretely applied to uh, situations involving real human beings. In our case, real indigenous communities or their members. I would like to emphasize that human rights treaty bodies established by both treaties adopted by the United Nations and by regional treaties uh, have recognized through an evolutionary interpretation the existence of a number of rights of indigenous peoples corresponding to obligations for the state's parties to the relevant treaties, even though in such treaties there are no explicit mentions to indigenous peoples themselves. 
And this is very important because human rights treaty bodies have shown to be sensible to the importance of guaranteeing the effective enjoyment of the rights of indigenous peoples. So, for instance, the Human Rights Committee, established by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, adopted in 1966, has recognized that an obligation of states parties to the covenant exists to provide an effective remedy and reparation measures for violations of land rights. And these measures must be commensurate with the harms sustained and uh, must take the form of the necessary measures to ensure that similar violations do not occur in, in the future. In addition, uh, there is an obligation of the state's parties to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights to adopt legislation designed to guarantee the full enjoyment of all indigenous people's rights under the covenant, including the restitution of communal lands. Another committee which has taken a similar position is the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, established by the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, adopted by the United Nations in 1965. According to the committee, state parties to the convention are under an obligation to take steps to return to indigenous peoples the lands and territories traditionally owned or otherwise inhabited or used, of which they have been deprived without their free and informed consent, only when restitution is not possible for objective factor reasons, the right to, restitu uh, to restitution should be replaced by the right to just, fair and prompt compensation. Such compensation should, as far as possible, take the form of lands and territories. Uh, this position was taken by the committee already in 1997. Uh, more broadly, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination has recently recognized a right to indigenous peoples to an effective remedy, for instance, when uh, in all cases in which uh, the, the free prior and informed consent has not been obtained by states before doing any activity which may result in a damage for the indigenous community concerned and more generally, when uh, the uh, right to self-determination and the autonomy of an indigenous community has not been recognized and has not been respected. At the regional level, the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, established by the American Convention on Human Rights of 1969, emerges and it is needless to say that this is particularly important for the territory of the Caribbean. Now, in my modest opinion, the practice of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights concerning reparations is probably the most advanced in the world. Uh, this is for the reason that the court pays particular attention to the collective dimension of reparations for indigenous peoples. In addition, it pays attention to ensure that the forms of reparations guaranteed to indigenous communities following violations of their rights are, uh, will be able to effectively redress the damage suffered according to the perception of indigenous peoples themselves. So, when situations of violations of land rights occur, the court is used to recognize a number of different forms of reparations, uh, all referring to the idea of the restitution in integral, restitution, which translates, among others, into the following. First, restitution and legal recognition of the community's collective ownership rights to the traditional lands and resources in accordance with their customary law, values, and usage. Secondly, 
collective title to these traditional lands and resources that confirms and effectively secures their ownership rights in accordance with their customary law. Third, physical delimitation and demarcation of the lands concerned. Fourth, guarantees of safety for community members inhabiting the lands concerned. And fifth, full participation and informed consent of community members in establishing the preceding measures, the measures that I have referred to in the previous point. But the significance of the practice of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights does not stop here for the reason that uh, in several cases, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has also recognized a number of measures of symbolic reparation uh, better said, satisfaction in favor of indigenous peoples, victims of violations of their rights. So uh, these measures are a lot. Uh, I will mention the, the principle once, and they include appropriate investigation concerning the facts of the case, public acknowledgement of responsibility, publication and dissemination of the judgment or a part of it in the language of the community concern, broadcasting of the judgment or parts of it, usually via radio, direction of a monument to memorialize the violation suffered, formal apology, establishment of developmental funds, no repetition guarantees and adaptation of domestic legislation to the relevant rules of the uh, American Convention of Human Rights. A similar approach, which has very much been inspired by the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court, has recently been followed by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, established by the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Uh, the Commission, especially in two cases, one uh, concerning Nigeria, uh, 2002, and one concerning the Endorais community in Kenya, and the, the communication was held in, was uh, released in 2009. The African Commission has recognized the right of indigenous communities to a number of reparations of the same kind of those uh, recognized by the Inter-American Court, especially in the most recent case, the commission held that there was an obligation uh, of Kenya to recognize rights of ownership to the indigenous community concerned and restitute their ancestral lands, ensure that the community members have unrestricted access to their traditional lands and surrounding sites for religious and cultural rights and for, and for grants in their cattle. Another measure of reparations consisted in paying adequate compensation to the community for the loss suffered and also an obligation for the state to pay royalties to the indigenous community arising from existing economic activities carried out in the traditional lands. Very recently, in 2022, 2022, a similar position was taken by the African Court on Human and People's Rights that, as you know, was established by a protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights adopted in 1998. And of course, the jurisprudence of the court is particularly important in Africa because its judgments are binding for the respondent state. And in a case also concerning Kenya, uh, the uh, court recognized the right of the indigenous community concerned to receive pecuniary compensation for the material damage suffered by the community. Pecuniary compensation, in addition, for the moral damage suffered by the community. Obligation for the state to take all necessary measures, legislative, administrative, or otherwise, to identify 
in consultation with the indigenous community concerned and the limit, the market and title ancestral lands and to grant collective title to such land in order to ensure with legal certainty the use and enjoyment of such lands by the community. In addition, uh, the court requested the respondent state to guarantee full recognition of the community concerned as an indigenous people. Take all necessary legislative, administrative or other measures to recognize, respect and protect the right of the community to be effectively consulted in accordance with the traditions in respect of all development, conservation or investment projects on its own ancestral land. Finally, the court recognized the existence of an obligation of the state to establish a community developmental fund. <coughs> Sorry. For the community concern, we should be a repository of all the funds ordered as compensation in the case. So, uh, before I come into my conclusion, I would also like to mention the Caribbean Court of Justice which is particularly relevant. There is a judgment of 2015 concerning the land rights of the Maya people of Belize. And even though in that case, the court was unable to recognize compensation for pecuniary damages suffered by the community, because according to the court, these damages cannot be ordered when they cannot be specifically proven. It recognized the right of the community to reparations for moral damages, taking into account the distress and suffering of the community arising from their violations of the core values and of their special relationship with their ancestral territories. And so uh, a number of practical measures of reparation was necessary. My conclusion, what kind of recommendations could be formulated for indigenous communities in the Caribbean in view of improving their access to reparatory justice? First of all, make pressure on governments to persuade them to ratify ILO Convention 169. We have seen that the convention includes a number of provisions of reparation, but so far among Caribbean countries, only Dominica has ratified the convention. Make recourse to judicial bodies at the national and regional levels, including the Caribbean Court of Justice, which have proven to be receptive with regard to instances of indigenous peoples. Third, and particularly important, it, it is necessary when possible to make recourse to international human rights treaty bodies. We have seen that they have developed an evolutionary interpretation of human rights standards, which is totally receptive of the rights of indigenous peoples. And in many cases, they have translated this interpretation into the recognition of concrete obligations for the state to recognize such rights especially when it comes to reparations for past wrongs. Last but not least, any kind of activities should be developed for the promotion and recognition of rights of indigenous peoples before governmental and other national institutions, NGOs, and the civil society. Uh, this was my conclusion. Thank you very much for your attention. And again, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to participate in this very important event. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Um, are you hearing me now?
Oh, yes, you are. So I want to say thank you very much for your very detailed presentation. Um, very, very legalistic, but but we, we, we were able to follow you. Um, we don't have very many lawyers here, but thank you very much. And I hope you will be available for um, some Q&A at some point during this um, conference, because you, you have raised some very important points and, and cited the various cases, Belize, um, Kenya, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm sure we will have some questions for you, but thank you very much on behalf of the organizers. And um, it is my duty now to return this mic to um, Sister Zola and Alice Brown. So thank you very much, Professor. Not a presentation to someone, but a as an item on the program. It has a title: the remembrance of Karatuma exile, and we it will be read. It was originally conceptualized as a dramatic presentation. But we will give you the grammar in the reading rather than in the actions. It would go for about four to five minutes. So I indulge you all. Thank you. Our story begins in St. Vincent. The small Eastern Caribbean island of extraordinary beauty and fertility. The interior is mountainous with many plains and well watered valleys, which before the 19th century were covered with forests. Our people, the Kainago of Karakuna, called the Rumi. The colonization of the Rumi by Europeans was typical of the Lesser Antilles, but it was so fiercely defended by the whole people that in 1659, it, that a 15, 1659 agreement in the English and the French established it. Other Kalinago people from other islands, such as St. Kitts and Antigua, escaping this colonial scourge. In 1748, the treaty signed by European by European nations declared the island of St. Vincent to be neutral. But by 1763, these European countries were at war. Subsequently, the Treaty of Paris was signed and St. Vincent was handed over to the British. Between 1764 and 1796, the British launched a war against all the people who removed them by force from the extensive fertile lands of which they controlled. The British wanted the lands to establish sugar plantations as part of their colonial economic expansion. Our people resisted fiercely and fought to defend their land and their independence. The British unleashed the might of their military arsenals 
including weapons of destruction upon the indigenous people of the UAE. At the end of the war, our people were required to surrender unconditionally, which meant the loss of their entire homeland, their culture, and their language. They refused to surrender. They were hunted down without mercy. Their houses and canoes were burned. Their crops were destroyed. The March 14th, 1795, Paramount Chief Joseph Chatelier was ambushed and killed at the set train. By October 1796, approximately 4,338 Garifunas had been captured and sent to Baliso, a small island off the coast of mainland St. Vincent, where they were kept as prisoners of war. Between October 1796 and March 1797, a period of six months, 2,140 of them were dead as a result of what the British called some malignant fever. Papers were preserved, papers preserved in British archives show that the idea of removing our people from St. Vincent entirely had been seriously considered long before the actual deportation to Manson. In a letter dated April 8, 1772, the Earl of Hillsborough told the governor of St. Vincent, and I quote, if necessity demands the removal of the carriage, you do pick up such vessels as can be produced to serve as transports for the conveyance of them to some unfrequented part of the coast of Africa or to some deserted island adjacent here. 25 years later, our people were forcibly exiled to the island of Rota of Central American coast of the US. On March 9, 1797, 2,248 of our people were boarded from Baliso on a convoy of 10 ships, forcibly deported, exiled from Yurumin forever. The names of these ships were the HMS Experiment, the Sovereign, the Boyston, the Trapeze, the Portuguese, the Ganges, the Prince William Henry, the John and Mary, the Seaman, and the Britannia. On April 12, 1797, 2,226 of them landed on the island of Duarte. 1,700 miles away from the Roman. From this small number, the Garifuna nation grew to what we are today. It is this history and this journey which provides the backdrop to this conference. We, the Garifuna, never forgot the trauma of separation from our homeland, the Roman, and from each other. It is remembered in our daily life, in songs and in spiritual ceremonies. The suffering of our ancestors on the island of Baliso was never forgotten and must never be forgotten. Our spirit of resistance and resilience and our story of survival 
will always be an inspiration to our people and to the world. We therefore wish to commemorate March 9th as a day of remembrance of the exile. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Laura and Brother David, for that remembrance. And this reflect fully or reflecting brings this conference to an end. And so I want to ask Brother Marlon Joseph to move a vote of thanks on behalf of the organizers. And thank you very much for all being a wonderful audience. So including in the vote of thanks this afternoon, well, let me say we hosted the school's National Garapuna Folk Festival last Friday, so the vote of thanks would be really would also acknowledge those people who made contributions to that event. So a big thank you to the collaborators of this conference or the main collaborator, the University of the West Indies, Open Campus, St. Vincent and the Grenadines the Ministry of Tourism and Culture, and I see Anil Beach is still here with us. Thank you, Ministry of Education, for your general support. The Bank of St. Vincent and the Grenadines for their financial assistance. Also providing financial assistance, the National Properties Limited and the Robertson Serving Services along with Gunsum Investment Limited. Kalena Peters, the team leader for this for this for the schools, Garapuna Folk Festival, Miss Marika Baptiste, who acted as the mistress of ceremonies, Miss Divine Walters for her guest presentation. Then big thank you to all of the judges, the ushers from the Thomas Saunders Secondary School, the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Band, Mrs. Beverly Taylor for her assistance with providing refreshments, also Mrs. Michelle Harris for assisting with providing the refreshments, the Sports Locker Plus for assisting with the trophies, all the participants from the schools, including principals and the staff who participated, VC3 for broadcasting live, Mr. Junior Mason, who was responsible for the sound system at the National School Folk Festival, the Caribbean Development Corporation, who provided us with the stage, Digicel St. Vincent and the Grenadines, for providing the tents and giving general marketing support, the National Lotteries Authority for providing us with the venue, the tables and the tents and chairs that were used, the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Football Federation for use of the venue because they actually had booked the park for, for football, but they seeded to us on that day, and we really appreciated that. And uh, for the decorations, the prop shop. For this afternoon, special thanks to Mr. Ronnie Daniel, and is someone that we can always rely on. Mrs. Frida Sidaraf and Mr. Newton George for the prayer. Miss Ulrika Games, who sung the national anthem. Mr. David Dark Williams, thank you for your remarks. This is Camille Lacram representing the University of the West Indies. Thank you for your remarks. The Honorable Curtis King from the Ministry of Education. The Honorable Carlos 
Dreams, Minister of Tourism and Culture. Thank you for your remarks. The National Insurance Services for use of this wonderful venue for the conference room. Thank you for those who provided the entertainment, the Clare Valley Government School, the CW Prescott Primary School, Rose Hall, Jammers, Shane Wynn. Thank you for your performances. Special thanks to Professor Elizabeth Middleton from the University of California who brought remarks. And of course, the keynote speaker, Professor Federico Lenzarini. Thank you so much for that presentation. Also, I must thank Miss, Mrs. Beach who took notes today. Of course, we have a repertoire and uh, the government printery for the programs and the invitations for the printing done. Mr. Montgomery Cupid and his team at the Hill News Network. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Miss Nola Craig and Mrs. Patricia Harris for refreshments and at the registration. Desk, Miss Kajana Peters, Mrs. Joanna Jack, Miss Harriet Bruce, and Miss Bernice Holmes, and all of the media houses came today. Thank you so much. And of course, the Girlfriend Heritage Foundation Secretariat staff, thank you for your general support. Thank you. And see you guys tomorrow. God's willing. Thank you for coming. Newton. Thank you.